Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Shilpa. Now, it's, uh, thank you everyone for coming. I realized that I did have very good slides. I think I have the worst slides out of all the speakers. So I hope I do a good job. Just curious, how many of you are in tech? Okay, so most of you are not from the tech industry. Okay, so um, I, my, a lot of my stories come from the tech industry. So hopefully they'll still be relevant. I'll try to make it more relevant for the non-tech, uh, folks from the non-tech uh, industries. So uh, this is about my fuck up story. Um, very happy to be at an event where I can use the word fuck all the time. <laughs> all right. It's... Okay, so I'll be talking about uh, my experience between 2010 to 20, 2013. Um, but before I actually get there, um, I just want to talk a little bit about what happened before that. So I've been in the tech industry for about 12 years. Um, I basically went through a uh, NUS program where they sent us to Silicon Valley for internship. And uh, I, ever since then, I mean, even before that, I, want, I knew that I wanted to be in tech. So I, I was in 2005 uh, when it was super cool to be in the, when it was not cool, in 2004 when it was not cool, when the internet still wasn't cool because, you know, the dot-com boom, the bus and everybody, um, you know, stopped thinking about starting software companies. Those who survive, you know, kudos to them. Uh, you wouldn't imagine what it's like to live through that kind of nuclear winter. Um, but I was there, I was in Silicon Valley. I was there between 2004, 2005. I witnessed how nobody was starting new companies to you know, the beginning of TechCrunch, which is this top block in the technology world. Um, it was the first party they held. This guy basically sat down one day, he had a job, and then he started writing, covering companies, praising some, you know, like uh, criticizing a ton of others. They threw a party, I went there, and I went for two, three of their parties. And I was like, wow, the tech industry is super cool and fun, right? So I, I think I picked the right industry. So I basically came back to Singapore. I started this uh, company called E27. Um, and you know, we've been running tech conferences um, for you know, back since then. Very happy to be here with Michael. I think Michael was one of the first few friends in the tech world um, that I knew in Singapore. And it's, uh, we, we grew E27. You know, at first, you know, we had a lot of uh, tech conferences. The government didn't like us. Then they liked us very much. Then they didn't like us a little bit. I'm no longer involved with them, um, but it was very exciting back in those days to be a renegade, a revolutionary in the industry. So I built several companies. This is my second company. Um, I, with E27, I had a good chance to look at how the Singapore startup ecosystem grew, um, how the investors grew along with that as well, and how the government fucked up so many times they'll be have, they have a wonderful fuck up night today <laughs> over here if they were here. Um, and so, but I grew tired of the startup ecosystem in Singapore. Um, I took grants as well from the government. I got very disillusioned. And I always thought about getting back to Silicon Valley, right? And so I did. I went back to Silicon Valley with this company. I basically closed down a successful business. We, we operated for nine months and we clocked a million dollars revenue. Um, and I gave that up to, to, because I was, I was doing a service business, right? We built websites, we built apps for other people. So I didn't like that kind of business. Uh, the margins were great, but I wanted to build a product company. So I closed that down. I shut that company down. I um, basically moved over to Silicon Valley and I live on your small detailings. I live on, uh, I think, $50 US a week. Uh, but US is more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> but I also did the bread thing. Yeah, I did, I did, a, I did a pasta thing because, you know, it must be more and more, you know. <laughs> Fried pasta. So we did that, we rented a place, we lived, we lived in, um, we lived in a, an apartment with like three, four other entrepreneurs. Uh, we tried to, you know, we, we tried to build our business. Uh, we stayed there for three months and then in three months time we were like, oh man, it's not working out yet, let's do another three months, right? So we started eating the savings as well. Uh, the budget went down from 50 to 30 and then we went to more events because food is free. Um, <laughs> So it's, uh, then you go there and you try to eat as much as possible. You try to bring back as well. You try to stay back all the way. Then you can bring back and have another free meal tomorrow. Um, and then at the six month mark, I managed to, I was very lucky. I met one of my mentors in the past. Uh, and then he decided, he brought us into a, his incubator that he started. So he's, he used to work in Google. He started an incubator. He funded us. 
he liked our idea around educational kids games. So these are the two products that we made. We made a preschool math game teaching kids, preschoolers, three to six years old, what math and English is, like the ABCs, the one, two, threes. And uh, we also built a um, storybook on the iPad. Um, this was the product that kicked us off because we built it in about two weeks, put it out on the App Store, I chased the media a lot, and then they featured us, and we actually made uh, about 50,000 US um, from two weeks' work. I was like, wow, that's why we moved to US, right? And then we said, you know, it'd be easy to get funding. It took, didn't take three months, took six months. Fast forward uh, six months later, we were behind this little app called Twitter, um, th number 37 on the US App Store, right? So the higher you go, the, the, more you f the deeper you fall, right? So we went out high, we raised money. Back then, this was a lot of money. We wanted to move back to Singapore anyway, so this is US dollars, half a million dollars. We raised half a million from Google Ventures, right? So we heard all these stories about crazy VCs you know, giving you a term sheet after you've pitched to them, that happened to us. So we were in a cafe, the guy was sitting down, listening to me the second time. We spoke for, I spoke for 15 minutes. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about, I don't remember anymore. But I remember at the end, he just, you know, said a bunch of stuff, I didn't really pay attention. Um, and I thought he, it was his nice way of saying no, right? And it's like, well, before I go, I've got something for you. I thought he was going to give us some, some stupid t-shirt or stickers from Google. <laughs> Um, he did not. He pulled out a, piece of, a few pieces of paper. He said, well, this is only good for 24 hours. I think blah, blah, blah. I didn't, I didn't remember the rest. Uh, it's like, wow, there's a term sheet, right? He said, we are going to be our lead investors. And, you know, and was excited. We were so excited. That was probably like the, um, I mean, I had been in the industry for like five, six years. And that was just amazing, right? I was like, wow, you know, like Google actually want to invest in our company. I was like, I went to a meeting knowing it's a no, right? So I did not expect it was, could possibly be a yes. So we came out of that. And so like the journey up to that point was like, wow, I've made it. This is amazing. I'm going to continue raising more money, millions, and you know, build a team and so on. But life hits you when you don't expect it. So fuck up was for our founders, right? I had one other co-founder. He, he wasn't so hot on VC funding, um, but he came around after spending three to six months in uh, Silicon Valley. And he wanted to bootstrap. At the point of time, if you are a developer, you probably are familiar with um, you know, DHH, David Heimler, um, who is the founder of Ruby on Rails. And he talked about how he bootstrapped his business all the way, and this is the right way to build a business and so on. So my co-founder was more in that philosophy, right? Um, he switched over more to VC because he realized how VCs could help us. Um, but we had a disagreement there. So I stopped raising, that's, that's why the number is so weird, because we, I was not supposed to close the round. Right? I only spent three months raising at a point of time, typically you take about six months to raise that million dollar round. I stopped at a weird number of 325,000, because he said, let's stop. Okay, well, I say I stop, right? I listen to you, you're my co-founder, we work on it. But it was not enough. And um, the problem started cascading after that, because we had to move back to Singapore. I continued. To live on the moon, no. I lived in the US. I lived in the US and I flew back as often as I could. And I could sleep on planes. So the 15, 16 hour plane ride wasn't a problem, even with the transit. Um, but he was based in Singapore. We built a team here. I was based there because I, you know, I, my, I needed to keep my investors happy, right? Because they, they were all mostly American based investors and they wanted me to stay there because the moment after I raised money, I have to raise, I have to project and think like, in one year's time, I need to raise the next round. So I was supposed to raise a million. The next round will be 3.5 million or so, right? But I only raised 300,000. So he said, you have to do more. You have to stay around, hang around, you know, talk to all the uh, media companies, talk to more VCs. So I was doing that, right? So like what Daryl was talking about, I was talking, I was on Sand Hill Road, you know, where all the VCs are, the guys who invested in Facebook and Google. I was trying to, you know, talk to all these guys, make sure I'm visible, showing the numbers. So I'll do meetings in the day, and then on the night, I will be talking to my co-founders in Singapore because you know, it's a 15 hour time zone difference, right? So I was maybe working about 16 hours, 17 hours on a regular basis for a few years. And um, I was flying back and forth as well. I didn't know what was going on over here. Whenever I came back, I was super frustrated. I was like, why is this thing so slow? You know, I was impatient. 
I was, you know, just not in a good spot. We, our relationship frayed, right? We were friends for maybe 10, 15 years. I mean, we started going out. I mean, we started hanging out, you know, partying when we were in the army. We knew each other in the army, right? And then we wanted to do a business together. Um, so, you know, this relationship started getting fraying. It happens when you are calling him, I mean, I'm calling him, maybe, you know, he goes, gets into work, maybe about 1, 2 a.m. U.S. time, and I'm up. Right? Maybe I attend, I put, I squeeze in a few networking events to talk to more meaningless, to take more meaningless meetings, right? And then I have to go there and I'm about to sleep. And then this is an important meeting. This is the only face time he has with me to think about what to do next. So I did that, right? I'm not saying that remote location doesn't work, um, but it requires a lot more effort. It's tougher when you're in a different time zone as well. The other thing for us was that the product iteration slowed down. Um, we, well, this could have been a function as well of the, this is gonna be a function of, you know, being very unclear about what we were really going for. Do we go for user um, growth? Do we go for revenue? Do we actually go for fundraising milestones? Because at, uh, for a good year, I was chasing a fundraising milestone because my investors were saying that this is the model you grow in the valley. This is the model you grow in the valley, right? So you need to chase the growth numbers, you need to chase the investors. You, you keep those leads warm. It took me two years before I realized that I don't need to keep the leads warm, right? I should really come back to Singapore, hang with my team, and then, you know, rebuild the relationship with my co-founder and my team. It was a little bit too late, right? So one and a half years later, I came back, right? Um, so one lesson learned over here is that be where your investors are or only get investors where you are. Um, we wanted to be based in the US and we were all in. We were all in. We were ready to move there. We got our visa sorted out and everything. I just needed to hit the 1 million mark and I was sure that I was, I was actually going to get it. But he pulled out. My co-founders and I couldn't agree. And so we had to make things work. And it's, when you're in, deep in a situation sometimes, it's very difficult to see clearly. It was very clear that these were great investors. They knew how to build products. They knew how to build teams. And I'm still very grateful to all of them, right? For all the things they have taught me because within the short span of time I was there, I learned so much, right? In six months, I learned something that I, you know, possibly in two, three years time could have learned, you know, if I stayed in Singapore back then. Um, and so I was still very grateful to them. But deep in the weeds, forced to make a split decision call, I made a decision that I only realized was wrong three, four years down the road, right? So we shouldn't have left. Once we left, we lost the entire mentorship environment. Once we were here, we went back to our old habits, right? We did not have product focus, investors, they did not know what we were doing. We started looking at what people, what startups, what companies around us were doing, and then we did the same thing. And then the expectations of the team, of the founders were out of sync with Silicon Valley. Right, with the investors. So that was, that was pretty important. If you run a startup, if you run a business, non-tech tech business in Southeast Asia, and then you have investors maybe say from Europe, from South Africa, South America, and so on, it, the, 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 there will be a different expectation as well. The responsiveness to the market, right? The ability to communicate with the customers, your media relationships, they will all suffer, right? So, and so when we reached this part, um, our slow product iteration velocity, it was, a, it, was a fact, it was a fact that we started getting lost where our goals were, right? We, we started losing sight of the bigger picture. So the left icon is both literal and uh, metaphorical as well. I literally had, I mean, actually both, sorry, both are literal. Um, I really had chest pains, right? So I would, I would go through a day and there will be, and the frequency would increase. I would be, and it would hit me, right? It would be sharp stabbing pains in my, in my, in my chest. I'll be like, oh shit, what, what's going on, right? At first I just shook it off, right? Um, then it would start happening more regularly, maybe two seconds, and it would still be sharp pain. And then I'll just get out, flex a bit, and I was like, okay, well, it's fine. So I went to see a cardiologist. I went to get a referral, so a specialist. And they, and they were like, Bjorn, you're too young. Um, it's like, no, I, I think there's something wrong. Right? It's been happening for a few years now. So I went to see a cardiologist. And then he did scans and so on and so forth, put me in an MRI machine. I came back to the same doctor and I said, there has to be something wrong. Um, and he also spread it my right. 
Then it's like, your heart is on your left. It's like, yeah, I know. Maybe I need to see a lung specialist, maybe. Maybe there's some specialist for the ribs. It was stress-induced pains. He, he sat me down, he asked me about my job. Right? He, he, he put all his papers away, pushed his keyboard in, and I was like, oh shit, he's going to tell me something bad. <laughs> Why would a doctor push his keyboard and put his notepad away, right? So uh, he was like, if you don't mind me asking you a few questions, what's going on in your life? He asked me about my health, my exercise. I was like, wow, this guy is really caring. He's got really good bedside manners. Um, he asked me about you know, my love life, uh, you know, and you know, like, uh, my family, and what do I do, and so on. He, he mentioned at the end, he said, the problem is not with your body, the problem is with your mind. Right? So he's going to refer me to uh, um, the Institute of Mental Health. I was like, In mental health, whoa. <laughs> I was relieved and I was very skeptical at the same time. Right? I was relieved that, oh, this is all in the mind, <laughs> there's no problem, right? I can fix that. And then second, I was like, yeah, it's, what are you going to do, right? Teach me to meditate. Yeah, and this irony, right? Because I'm making a meditation app now. Um, <laughs> so I was, like, uh, I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'll take the referral, but you know, I'm going to see you for the last time, right? So I, I went out and um, I also broke up with my girlfriend back then, right? So this, um, this was a double whammy in terms of the, uh, heart, the, the, the heart pain, right? That's what, this what one thing. The other thing also was that after about four years of pushing this startup, we realized that we reached the end of the road. The relationship was so frayed, I decided to part ways with my co-founder while we were still, well, there was still some form of friendship to salvage. And also more importantly, there was still about 50,000 left in the bank, right, US dollars, which is good. That time, exchange rates were 1.6 or 1.7. So that's quite a decent sum for pivoting. I put myself 80,000 to pivot into another different space that didn't work out as well. We eventually sold the company for the assets. This is a picture. Two okay, this is a picture of the meditation retreat that I went to. Uh, it's in India, northern India. I spent about 10 days there, 16 hours of meditation per day. I woke up at four, I sleep at nine, and um, it was to help to deal with my stress, right? So I spoke to the doctor, and he said that uh, you should, you know, really try to do some the de-stressing, more de-stressing activities. Go exercise, you know, don't drink, um, you know, go, <laughs> go learn to, you know, decompress. So I did that. I learned about meditation at the peak of uh, my stress levels um, and I found it super useful. And uh, this is what, you know, got me on my present journey. It was an eat, pray, love trip as well. So I went there, I didn't exactly pray, it's non-religious. Uh, I went there to eat. Uh, Indian food is great, I love Indian food. Um, and I think, you know, when you actually do nothing but just meditate the entire day, any food is going to taste great. So maybe that's why. Uh, I also went with this uh, lady who later became my, um, uh, my girlfriend. So it's, uh, I should really write it down, but never mind. Um, so this is what I did after my startup completely failed, closed. I we sold all the assets, um, didn't make our investors back the money, um, but I was so tired of the tech industry. I needed, to, I needed to really, literally take a step back. Um, there, were, there were some times as well, right, as Tailing mentioned, I found myself gravitating more towards the words suicide, depression, and so on. It happened that when I closed this company, within the portfolio of my investor, there was a very high-flying, pro, high-profile um, founder uh, who actually committed suicide. So at the peak of his company, he was great. He was uh, running a very successful business, uh, appearing the news all the time. He committed suicide. Um, that was a wake-up call because I realized, whoa, I was close. Um, I did not know how to articulate the thoughts back then, but it did cross my head sometimes. I was like, this would be so easy. I had so many high expectations. I feel so bad. You know, like, I don't know how to face my friends. I don't know how to face my investors. I don't know what I should do after this. After I closed my company for two solid good months, all I did every day was that I didn't shower and I, did, I played games the entire time. Um, I just didn't feel like doing anything at all. So I was in the pits. Um, and so I was so sick of the tech world. I, you know, I don't know why I still play games. Um, I was so sick of the tech world that I decided to go off grid completely. So I went to New Zealand and I spent about a month um, living on farms over there and just working with my hands, right? So I did not look at you know, any computers um, you know, back in that time. This was, this was about 2013. So I stayed on a sheep farm. 
it was about one quarter the size of Singapore and they had 6,000 over sheep. I think I captured about 600 over here. Uh, <laughs> they had, uh, and it was just great, right? Being close to nature, you know, it was like, oh wow, this is what life really kind of feels like, you know, um, outside of the bubble of the tech world, Silicon Valley and, and so on and so forth. So I used that, I you know, began to practice and learn more about meditation and this particular trip, this one month, allowed me to rediscover my soul, right? The real human insight, um, you know, what are my real purposes, what do I want to do next, and so on and so forth. So um, going off-grid is great. So ever since then, I have uh, done off-grid vacations at least once every year, just you know, so that I, I, when I come back, I come to appreciate the technology and the industry that I actually work in. Um, but absence makes the heart grow fonder in some sense, and that's true where off-grid vacations are for people who surround themselves with tech all the time. All right? So I'll still be hanging out here for a while, but that's the end of my presentation anyway. I hope I'm on time. No. Yeah, okay. I'm not on time, sorry. Yeah, okay, but thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Bring our speakers forward and then we can have a